Beautiful. Thank you, worship team, for uh, leading us thus far in our worship. We'll continue our worship now as we come to the Lord's Word. As Damien mentioned, my name is, is Alex. I'm here this morning with uh, my wife, uh, Nia, and we have uh, three children. My, Noah is my, my eldest son. He is uh, seven. We have little Ivana. She's five. And, uh, and little Arthur. He is about to turn three. Uh, we attend New Community Church just over the hill in, in Ingle Farm. I'm, a, uh, I'm actually a carpenter builder by trade, but, but at the moment I'm actually also studying uh, pastoral ministry at uh, the Master's Seminary over in uh, Southern California. It's interesting, this morning as we were driving in, I was talking to my wife and, and I realized that this is actually my very first time ever coming over here to, to, to Oakton, to City Reach. And, um, but even though it is my first time, I feel like I've actually had many connections from Oakton over, over the years. I used to uh, stay with, with Jeff and, and Val May Honick. Um, Jeff was, was actually our pastor at New Community Church before he and Val May retired over in New Zealand. Uh, Noah, my eldest son, he attends Cedar College here, and Ivana will be joining her next year. And so we've seen it, many familiar faces, even this morning. And I was speaking with my parents yesterday at my daughter's birthday party, and, and they reminded me that uh, um, uh, back when I was a kid, um, Les Crawford um, from, uh, from, sent out from you guys, he used to come and preach, actually, up in the, in the Barossa Valley. And uh, I think if I remember correctly, Les actually used to have a ponytail way back when. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Anyways, thank you so much for uh, welcoming us here this morning, and it's a wonderful blessing to be able to open up God's Word with you this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, please open up with me this morning to Matthew chapter 7, the passage that was read for us a moment ago, Matthew chapter 7. We'll be working through verses 21 through 27 this morning. This passage, when, when Graham contacted me a few weeks ago and asked me to, uh, to come down, I was so thankful when he, he chose this particular passage not just because I'm a builder and the construction imagery that the Lord uses in this passage, but even more so because of my own testimony, my own walk with the Lord. I had the incredible blessing of being raised in a, in a Christian home, in a, in, a, in a home committed to Christ, in a home where the gospel was taught uh, readily. And even thinking back now, I, I remember many times, as a kid even, making a profession in Christ. I remember praying the sinner's prayer in, in Sunday school, even at a young age, thinking that I was a Christian. However, at the age of 12 or, or 13, I, I soon found that my, my conscience was, was increasingly troubled by a growing pattern of, of sin in my life. And so at 13, I, I made a second profession of, of, of faith in Jesus Christ, and, and, and to so many people who knew me during my, my early teenage years, I was giving every appearance of being a genuine Christian. I was involved in the life of the church. I was active in my youth group. I knew my Bible well. I wasn't openly rebellious to my parents, aside from the, the odd burnout in my VL Commodore every now and again. But overall, I was a typical nice, everyday sort of kid. For the most part, I really believed that I was a Christian. After all, I'd said the sinner's prayer, right? I would participate in Christian activities in the life of the church. I would listen to sermons and so on. But it wasn't until the age of 17 that I actually came to saving faith in Christ. And it was at that time that I could look back over that period of my life and see that for years, I had lived in, in self-deception. For years, I had lived self-deceived, even though what I had built, I had built what appeared to myself and to many others as well as, as though this, this facade of a, of a Christian life. And that's why this passage is, is so important to me this morning, because the difference it has made in my own life. Sadly, self-deception is a real danger in the church today. We live in an age of, of cheap grace, in an age where, where many teach that you can accept Jesus as Savior, but not submit your life to Him, to not submit to Him as Lord of your life. Self-deception, sadly, is rife in the church today. The church is full of people who say, yeah, I love Jesus. 
I love Jesus, but then they go home and they live however they want to live, never thinking even once about the seriousness of sin. There are most definitely people out there this morning who are just like I was. They've made some profession, they've prayed some prayer, and yet they live in self-deception. If you would peel back the layers of their life, examine their life, you would find they are missing the foundation. They are missing a heart that longs to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so with this passage this morning, I want us to carefully look at three things. I want us to carefully look at the simple story of the two builders, the similarities of the two builders, and the separation of the two builders, so that we might be encouraged. We might be encouraged in obedience, that we might be encouraged to examine our hearts and overcome any doubt of self-deception in our own lives. This passage that we read that was read to us by Damien before actually has two very distinct parts. Verses 21 through 23, they contain the warning themselves, the warning against self-deception, against making a false profession in Jesus. And then in verse 24 through 27, we have Jesus' illustration of that same danger. And that illustration that he uses is a parable. When we think of parables, they are word pictures that Jesus uses to lay alongside truth. That's what a parable are. It's a story that is laid alongside truth to drive home a spiritual reality. This parable is no different. We have the, the simple story of, of two builders, but alongside that simple story, we also have this spiritual truth that Jesus is trying to make. In order to understand the spiritual truth, we also have to examine the simple story. So first we have the wise builder. Jesus in this man, Jesus in this story calls this man wise, meaning he is a man of, of insight. He's prudent. And the reason why Jesus calls him wise is because of how he chose to build his family's home. Notice verse 24. He built his house on the rock. What does that mean? Well, again, just on a simple story level, it means that this man, he dug down the sandy soil of Israel, right, until he got to that limestone bedrock. This is something that requires a lot of, of effort. Sometimes that bedrock can be a long way down. It's not like the, the convenience of today's modern building practices where you would just bring in the excavator. No, this was by hand. This was pick and shovel. He dug until he got to that bedrock. And then from there, he began to build the foundation of his house. At some point, after he finished, his work was tested by a massive Mediterranean storm that had blown in off the sea. Notice verse 25. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and slammed against that house. You can picture this man sitting inside, watching in fear to, to see what happens. And verse 25 tells us the outcome of it. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Now this wise man, he also has a neighbor who is building a house next door at the same time. Jesus calls this man the foolish builder. And the reason Jesus calls him the foolish builder is because how he chose to build his house. Notice verse 26, he built his house on the sand. So you can imagine, it's probably dry season when they started this construction job. He probably walked out to his plot of land and, yep, that feels, that feels pretty dry. And, uh, and this guy thought, yeah, that's, that's plenty strong to be able to build my house off of. And he just starts constructing his house straight off the ground. At some point, the same massive storm that threatened the neighbor's house also threatens his house as well. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds slammed against that house. Notice verse 27, and its fall was great. That's just the simple story level of this parable, the basic story level. Most of us can picture it. Most of us can see the imagery that the Lord uses. And it's be important to begin with the, the basic elements of the story because the basic elements become clear because of the context in which the Lord uses them. Notice verse 24 there. The Lord uses the word, therefore. This links this parable back to the warning about the false profession in the previous verse. Jesus is still talking about that same danger, the danger of making a profession in Christ that isn't genuine. 
So then it becomes clear. The wise builder, he is a genuine Christian. The foolish builder, he is a false disciple of Jesus Christ, someone who has made a profession in Christ, but they don't really know Jesus. And the two first century homes, these two similar homes, they represent the external lives of two professing Christians. One that without careful inspection, they would seem to be almost identical. And that's the meaning of the basic elements of this story. But as we seek to apply the spiritual lesson of this story, we need to dig a little deeper. Secondly, let us consider the striking similarities, the striking similarities between these two men and their houses. It's funny how Christian literature often can misinform us or, or skew our pictures of, of Bible stories sometimes. Uh, I, I looked at a couple of my kids' books about this very parable, and the image was, imagery was, was very similar. They pictured one house up on top of a cliff, and the other half house down on a sandy beach. And often that is the imagery we can think of when we, when we read this parable. But notice as, as we just read through that, that parable before, Jesus describes these two men and their houses in this passage, also the parallel passage in Luke, in almost identical language. In fact, it's crucial to Jesus' main point for us to see and understand what these two men and their houses have in common with each other. Jesus intends for us to picture two almost identical houses standing next to each other, side by side, threatened by the exact same storm. There's no one house up on the hill, one house on the beach. They're side by side in the same street together. That's at the simple story level, of course. But even at the spiritual level, this is true as well. I want us to note several remarkable spiritual similarities between the wise man and the foolish man. Let us note these things together. First of all, let's note that both men made a profession of Jesus as Lord. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that is what initiated this whole warning that Jesus tells us about. Jesus recognizes that there are people that are attached to him, people that had heard the gospel from him, people that professed him as Lord, but yet weren't doing what he commanded them to do. That's what initiated this entire warning. So understand that, that these men made a profession of faith. And Jesus pictures two kinds of people, a true disciple and a false disciple. But they both say, Lord, Lord. Both profess Jesus as Lord. Verse 22, even at the final judgment, the false disciple will continue to confess Jesus as Lord. Both of these men made a profession. The second similarity, both men heard Jesus' teaching, they heard the gospel. Most men heard the gospel. Notice verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine may be compared to a wise man. Verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine will be a foolish man. So understand they are similar in that they both listened to Jesus' teach. Both can hear the gospel being presented. You know, a person who is self-deceived as well as a true disciple, both can enjoy hearing the gospel. Both of them can enjoy hearing Jesus teaching. They can enjoy studying the Bible, listening to sermons about the Bible. There's a third similarity between these men. Both men built seemingly Christian lives that looked the same externally. They built a house that looked like a Christian life. Both of them did. Clearly, these men built two houses in their culture that would have been largely the same. They were next to each other in the same location. They're probably similar in size, using the similar building materials. There was much that these houses would have had in common. See, one point Jesus is making here is, is that the difference between a true disciple and a false disciple is not always easy to spot. Professing Christians and professing Christians genuine and false can often look very much alike. You cannot always easily tell which one is which. Both can be members of the visible Christian community. Both can read the Bible. Both can listen to sermons. But what is the, what is the real difference that you can't see between, the, what is the real reason you can't see the difference between them? 
It's because that deep foundation is often hidden from view. That foundation is often out of sight and cannot be easily seen. And we can understand this even on an everyday basis. You take the suburb of, of Northgate or, or Oakton, for example. You drive down the street, and aside from the single or double-story houses, most of the houses look pretty similar. You can imagine, though, that if the builder of one of those houses, he, he came along, he didn't pour a deep foundation, instead he only poured a, a little 100 mil foundation, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell as you drive past the house. Our communities are filled with people who have built what appears to be a Christian life, but so many lack a deep foundation. It looks great on the outside, as you drive past, but recognize that's a point of similarity between these two builders. There's a fourth similarity between these two men. The truth of both men's lives will be revealed at the judgment. That is what the storm in this story represents. Some have described this, this storm here as, as referring primarily to the, the storms of life that, that, that come in, the pressures of life come in and they destroy a, a false profession. And, and in some cases, that is true. But the storm here in this parable is, is talking about God's final judgment. And it's for a couple of reasons. First of all, just from the language that Jesus Christ uses here, when he speaks a parable, often he speaks it in, the ter in, in language like, the kingdom of God is like this, or, or can be compared to this, right, when he speaks a parable. But notice in, in verse 24, Jesus uses the future tense. He says the kingdom of this wise man will be like this. The foolish man will be like this. So at some point in the future, these men will be like a wise man or will be like a foolish man. Also, Jesus is talking about final judgment in verses 21 through 23 when they appear before him. And so there's no reason to believe that he's changed views when he gets to verse 24 through 27. And also, in the Old Testament, storms are often used to picture God's final judgment let me give you an example of this. Turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah 23, please. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23 says, verse 19, Behold, the storm of the Lord has gone forth in wrath, even a whirling tempest. It will swell down on the head of the wicked, the anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purposes of his heart. In the last days, you will clearly understand this. Jeremiah is saying here in this passage, as he talks about false teachers and false prophets, he's saying there is a coming day when God will unleash his wrath and his fury, and it will be like a hurricane has been unleashed on planet Earth, a massive storm of cosmic proportions. So understand this, that the storm in this parable represents the final storm of God's judgment. You can think of it something like this. At the judgment, Jesus will subject the claim of all those who profess him as Lord to the storm of his penetrating presence and omniscience. And the one without a foundation, that life will ultimately be completely destroyed. Four striking similarities between these men this morning. But the point that Jesus is getting at here is not what these men and their houses have in common. The real point is to highlight the stark separation that these men have. Because between these two men, the separation, the differences that they have. The most common difference between these two men is that they have a different foundation. Wise man built his house on the bedrock on a solid foundation. The foolish life built his Christian life without one. And the second difference is that between these two men, they have tragically different destinies, different eternities. The professing Christian who has built his life on the rock, he will endure the judgment. He will prove to be a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, the person who has not built his life on the rock, he will prove to be a false disciple of the judgment. So much so that the Christian facade that he has built up will collapse and it will be turned into rubble. 
Look at the result, verse 23. Jesus will say to him, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. So the key question we have to ask is this. As you look at the story this morning, what is the foundation? What is the foundation? Because one with it will survive the judgment, one without will not. You ask most Christians what the foundation represents in this parable, and they will say, well, of course, the, the rock is Christ. And that's true in various places in Scripture. Christ is presented as, as a rock. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, for example. We also sing this, that wonderful hymn that talks about Christ as the rock in the sense that everything is because of what he did. Our confidence is in Christ alone and his work. And so we can sing, on Christ's solid rock I stand, no other ground is sinking sand. It's a wonderful hymn. I love that hymn. It actually borrows from this parable. But it's not actually the point of this parable. The rock in this parable, the foundation in this parable that the wise man builds his life on is more specific than that. It's Christ, yes, but with some explanation. Look again at verse 24 with me. Verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine, underline this in your Bibles if you have a pen, and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Look at verse 26. Everyone who hears these words, underline this again, and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. In both cases, these words, uh, these words of mine, Jesus obviously is talking about his, his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount where this text occurs, but by implication it means, of course, everything that he taught. Both of these men, they heard Jesus' teaching, but the key difference between them is one acted on the words of Christ and the other did not. In verse 24, that expression acts on them. It literally means everyone hearing these words of mine and doing them. Everyone who hears my teaching and has a pattern of life seeks to do them. You see, the foundation in this story is more than just hearing Christ's teaching. The foundation is more than just believing in Christ's teaching. It's more than just respecting Christ's teaching. The foundation in this story is a walk of obedience to the truth of Christ's teaching. You can have an intellectual knowledge of Christ. You can make a verbal profession of Jesus Christ. And both of these facts are essential in our salvation. But they can never be a substitute for obedience. Anyone can call him Lord. Anyone can hear his words. Anyone can listen. Anyone can study and ponder and memorize scripture until their minds are stuffed with his teaching. But those things without obedience are what Christ here calls foolish, without a foundation. What is this obedience? What is this wise foundation. Obedience is a life in total submission to the Lordship of Christ. Remember the fool, he will call him Lord at the judgment seat, so it's more than a profession. Is the Lordship of Jesus Christ, which you profess, one of your life's major realities? This has always been the distinction between a true and a false believer. Even in the Old Testament, this is true. The distinction has been made. Turn back with me to the book of Ezekiel this morning. Ezekiel chapter 33. And we'll look at verse 30 together. Ezekiel 33, verse 30. But as for you, O son of man, your fellow citizens talk about you by the walls and in the doorways of the houses and speak to one another, each to his brother, saying, come now and hear what message comes forth from the Lord. So you see, Ezekiel, he was the subject of a lot of chatter, a lot of conversation around the, around the city. People love, people love Ezekiel. They loved hearing Ezekiel. Let's go listen to Ezekiel, verse 30 tells us. 
Verse 31, they come to you as people come and sit before you as my people and they hear your words, but they do not do them for they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth and their heart goes after gain. They loved Ezekiel. They loved hearing his teaching. Notice verse 32 though. Behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not practice them. Verse 33. So when it comes to pass, it referring here to judgment, when judgment comes to pass, as surely it will, then they will know that a prophet has been in their midst. These people, they weren't believers. God was going to bring his wrath and his judgment on them, but they sat as though and listened as though they were really God's people. This has always been the mark, the distinction between a true and a false disciple. The true disciple hears God's word and seeks to obey them. Now, it's not true, of course, that a true believer perfectly keeps God's word, Remember, even in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus goes through the Lord's Prayer, he says, Father, forgive us our debts. They were called to pray that each day. Of course we sin. We sin every day. But a true believer's life is marked by a pattern of heart submission to Jesus Christ and his teachings. The foundation that distinguishes a genuine Christian from a false Christian is not just saying Jesus is Lord. It's not just having the right doctrine. It's not having spiritual zeal. It's not serving in some kind of ministry. It's not even listening to Jesus' words or building a Christian life like these people did. The foundation of rock is a heart that bows completely to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You hear his words and you seek to obey them. The flip side is, the foundation of sand is when a false disciple hears Jesus' words and doesn't consistently seek to do what he's been commanded to do. Don't misunderstand me. We're not saved by our obedience. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Christ alone. But when there is genuine faith in Jesus Christ, it will always produce, after conversion, true obedience to the word. And that is the point that our Lord is making here this morning. As I said at the start, we live in an age of Cheap grace, where cheap grace makes many promises to people. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Just add Jesus and carry on. But you can't have Jesus Christ only as your savior. It doesn't work like that. Christ comes as a package deal. Salvation comes as a package deal. You can't have Christ as your savior unless you also obey him as Lord. You can't segment your life into two parts. You cannot say, yeah, I I want that salvation part, but that day-to-day obedience, yeah, I want to reign and rule in my own life. It doesn't work like that. Salvation is a package deal. He is both Savior and He is Lord. And you obey Him as such. And if you have not come to Him like that, then you have not truly come to know Him. There is no middle foundation, no no half foundation of of the indifferent or the half serious. There's either a life built on Christ and obedience to His word or the sand of self deception. Remember the the sandy foundation, that's not just a straight up pagan living the worldly life. No, the sandy foundation, that's someone living the Christian life. That's someone walking the Christian life among us. Someone talking Christianese. Someone saying the right things. And yet there is no true heart submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And when judgment day comes, as surely it will, there is nowhere to hide for you. So what for us now? What for us this morning? Where do we go from here? As I said at the beginning, we must 
take this opportunity to examine our hearts. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Ask that question this morning. Great opportunity. Have I built a life, a Christian life, that is merely a front for disobedience and sin? Or is the truth that I profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord displayed in a life of submission to the Lord Jesus Christ? To those of us here this morning who know the Lord as true disciples, don't be disheartened or discouraged, wondering if you are saved or or if you are not. Rather, be encouraged. Examine your heart. Examine your life. See the areas that perhaps you need to, to change in. Remember, there's, there's no specific sin mentioned here in this parable, only that we would have the foundation of rock that is Christ and obedience to his word. And that's on purpose, right? Because it gives us a chance to ask. It gives us a chance to pray. Are there any areas in my life that I need greater submission to the Lordship of Christ? Are there any areas in my life where obedience is lacking? What areas? Start by examining how your relationship is with the Lord. How is your prayer time? How is your time in God's Word? Do you study God's Word? Next, examine if you have any idols in your life, things that you love more than God. Money, possessions, family, comfort, school perhaps. What do you prioritize in your life? Church, church events, social life. Things that just bring you temporal joy. Are you actively serving in the body of Christ? Are you using your spiritual gift to minister to the body? Are you discipling somebody? Are you being discipled? yourself. What about contentment issues? Is there something in your life that you want so badly that you're trying to push God in that direction? Or are you fully content in and where the Lord has you in this season right now? As you examine your life and you see what the Lord is doing, as true believers, we should always be humble enough that we've to know that we've never made it when it comes to obedience. There's no such thing as sinless perfection. Each and every day we need to spend time praying, asking the Lord to help us put off sin and put on righteousness. This morning, if you sit here and you are even a little unsure of the foundation that you have. If you look at your life, you examine the good works that you do, but you know that that foundation of obedience is missing. Don't ignore the Spirit's prompting this morning. This parable serves as an invitation. Christ offers every false disciple to truly repent, to truly believe. Praise God. We still live in a day of grace, amen? The tribulation is yet to come. There is still hope for you. So what must you do now if this is you this morning? Well, you come before a holy God. You acknowledge that you are a hopeless sinner in need of saving. You acknowledge that nothing you have, he wants. Nothing, you have nothing that will please him. Nothing that will satisfy him. You come before a holy God and you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I deserve nothing from you. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Make me new. Give me the capacity to obey you. If this is you this morning, humble yourself. Give up your pride. Give up your rebellion and ask the Lord to receive you this morning. Yahweh saves. Yahweh rescues. Jesus will save his people from their sins as Gabriel told Joseph way back when. Jesus became a curse. Jesus came dying in our place, bearing the wrath of God in our stead. And when this change takes place in your life, he will make you a new person in Jesus Christ. It's called regeneration in the New Testament. He's not just going to change you a little bit. He's going to radically change your life, give you new desires, give you new love for new things and hate for the things that you used to love. He's going to change your life 
through the power of your Holy Spirit. He's going to declare you righteous in his sight. He's going to forgive your sin. He is molding you into the image of your son, of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May this be the day of your salvation this morning. Brethren, there's only two choices before us this morning. A life of obedience or the sand of self-deception. Which one are you? Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to come before you again this morning to open your word, to see the truth of your word. Father, we confess that daily we we fall short of your standard, daily we miss the mark as it were. Father, and we we ask for your forgiveness in these things. Father, pray that you uh, you you would forgive us for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Father, we know that you are just and faithful to forgive us our sins when we confess them before you. We thank you for the the truth of this passage this morning. May it cause each and every one of us to examine our lives, to find the, the areas in which we fall short. Lord, that we might come and grow in our relationship with you. If there is anyone among us this morning, Lord, that does not know you, Father, may they not leave this place without first speaking to someone without being made right with you. Lord, use your spirit, use your word in our lives this morning. We pray these things in the precious name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ.